but um, let's uh, get going here. We're just going to start right in. Our next content, the one baptism. Now, this is one of those ones that now everyone else might be along with me so far, but uh-oh, now you're starting to meddle here, okay? The one baptism. Ephesians chapter 4, okay? Ephesians chapter 4. If Paul says in verse 1, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord teach you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called, with all lowliness and meekness and longsuffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of what? Peace. There is more controversy and a lack of unity and a lack of peace over this subject than any of the others that we talk about. Most people who will argue about it will tell you it's really not important. But they will argue about it. I have seen families divided over the subject that's not important. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace, there is one body, one spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, several baptisms, one God, and what? One baptism, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Okay, let's just speed through here. <clears throat> the fact is, in Scripture, there are there are many baptisms mentioned in Scripture. There are many baptisms mentioned in Scripture. Water baptism is mentioned in Mark chapter one and verse four. Now, that's not the first time water baptism is mentioned in Scripture. We don't have time to go into all of that in this, but if you want to study uh, baptism, most people think there are two things that are, are unique to the New Testament church, baptism and the sign gift. Baptism and the sign gift. Those are unique to the New Testament church. The Pentecostal church will teach you those are unique to the church. The problem with that is it's not true. It's not true. The sign gifts were first given in, in Exodus as God was calling out Moses to go into Egypt to bring the nation of Israel, who's he dealing with? Israel, out of bondage. And remember, he gave to Moses two signs. What were they? The rod and the Remember, he put his hand in his coat, and it pulled it out. It was leprous. Put it back in, pulled it out. It was fine, all right? And he says, and the, and the scripture says, what if they don't believe the first sign? And he gives them a latter, a second sign. So sign gifts were given as God began to deal with the nation of Israel. And they were God's confirmation that this man, in this case Moses, was a spokesman for God, all right? Baptism, a New Testament thing. Oh, no, it isn't. The writer of Hebrews talks about the baptisms of the Old Testament. You go back to the, to the, to the tabernacle in the wilderness. In the tabernacle in the wilderness, what sat right outside the door to the holy place? Uh, the laver or the baptismal font. And, and every priest that entered the holy place had to stop first and baptize or wash himself before he could enter into the very presence of God. And, and, and every priest, who, every man who became eligible for the priesthood and became of age to be a priest, stood at the laver and was washed. He's baptized. Baptism is not a New Testament thing. It's Old Testament. And there are many baptisms mentioned in the scripture. 
Water baptism, we can find that in Mark chapter 1 and verse 4, and we won't take time because of the rush to do that. Uh, a baptism by death. Jesus called his, his death on the cross a baptism. A baptism. Okay. <clears throat> we are baptized with Holy Spirit. Mark chapter 1 and verse 8. Luke chapter 3, verse 16. Acts chapter 2. Right? Baptized with Holy Spirit. And the passage we read earlier, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 13, we are baptized by the Holy Spirit into Christ. So you have a baptism with the Holy Spirit and a baptism by the Holy Spirit. Okay? And we'll come back to that, but we have those as just examples of that. Paul refers to in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 2, or verse 1 and 2, right? 1 and 2, they were baptized in the cloud and in the sea. What do you have there? You have both a, a dry baptism, the cloud, and a water baptism with the sea. Okay? There are three primary baptisms in Scripture. And, of course, you know, there's lumpers and splitters. We're going to lump them down here. There are figurative. Of course, the death baptism is not a baptism as we think about it. He spoke in a figurative way. What his death was was figuring something or uh, illustrating something or speaking of something. Uh, he also speaks of being uh, baptized with fire. Um, of course, that's not li literal. It's a figurative thing. It talks about fire and judgment in Scripture. When he's talking about being judged with fire, he's talking about a judgment of God. Or baptized with fire, some of a judgment of God is something's going to come upon them. Okay? Uh, and then, of course, there's the cloud again. <clears throat> there are ceremonial baptisms. That's the diver's washing that I mentioned earlier in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 10 and referring back to Exodus 30. And there you go back to the tabernacle and the works that are going on there. You have the ceremonial washings or baptisms. And, of course, like I said, they were baptized as they entered into the priesthood, Exodus 29, Leviticus chapter 8. And actually, it's a proper understanding of this one that gives us an understanding of why Jesus was baptized. Why Jesus was baptized. Okay. <clears throat> The Hebrew, uh, rahas, means, the, the washing there means to wash away or to cleanse. And, and in the ceremonial washing, they would wash away. Paul, uh, Ananias ministered to Saul of Tarsus. Saul of Tarsus believed. What did Ananias tell him to do? Arise, be baptized, and wash away your sins. It was a cleansing. It was a cleansing that they submitted to. There's a spiritual baptism. The baptized with Holy Ghost. With Holy Ghost. And we saw that Mark 1.8, Acts, Acts chapter 2 is, is also there. Um, the events there. And then, of course, by the Holy Spirit. Those are spiritual type baptisms. Okay? The one thing you always have to keep in mind is when they're baptized with the Holy Ghost or with Holy Ghost, they're talking about the power of the Holy Ghost coming upon them. In Luke chapter 22 or 24, Jesus would tell his disciples just before he ascended into heaven, he would tell his disciples, go back to Jerusalem and tarry there until you be endued with power from a high. And this power will come upon you. Okay, so the disciples go back to Jerusalem. They're in Acts chapter 2. They're tearing, they're praying, and they're in that upper room. And all of a sudden, what happened? Remember? A sound filled the house. And all of a sudden, what sat upon them? A fire that looked like a tongue. It was, you know, like that, flickering on the top, sat on them. And, and they came under the power, and the, and the scripture says in Acts chapter 2, and I think it's verse 4, they were filled with the Holy Ghost. 
in chapter 3, it says the house, or in verse 3, it says the house was filled with the sound of a rushing mighty wind. In verse 4, it says the disciples there were filled with Holy Ghost. Now, most people read that, and they see those words filled, and they say, well, it's the same filled, filled. Filled means filled. But you realize, if you go back and you look, that those two words are two different Greek words translated filled. The one in verse 3 primarily means it filled it up. You take a glass and you fill it with water, right? Until it overflows. That glass is full of water. There was nowhere in that house they could go that they didn't hear that sound of that rushing mighty wind. The word filled in verse 4 can mean that. It can mean that. But it also can mean to fall under the influence of something. Okay? So this Holy Ghost comes into the room. It fills the room. The power comes and sits upon them. They are clothed upon from on high, Luke chapter 24. The power comes upon them, and immediately, what did they begin to do? Speak in tongues. What were they? They came under the influence of Holy Ghost, of the power of the Holy Ghost. Now, one thing that we'll see in a little bit is the uniqueness is what you and I have today, we are not under the power of the Holy Ghost. We have the person of the Holy Ghost dwelling within us. Wow. Wow. We have the person of the Holy Ghost dwelling with us. The first time the person of the Holy Ghost speaks in the New Testament is found in Acts chapter 13 in verse 2. When he says, separate me now, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereon to I have called them. You know what he's doing there? The Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, at that very moment is cutting out Saul and Barnabas so that he can start something new. The church, the body of Christ so that he can soon introduce something brand new. What is it? The mystery. The mystery. And the Holy Spirit himself now comes forward and speaks and begins to direct traffic, so to speak. Okay? So we have this. <clears throat> and and um, in the Old Testament, it was a rite of washing, a rite of cleansing, coming into the New Testament. It was a rite of washing. They were to, uh, they believed and they were baptized and they washed away their sins. They did those works of meat unto righteousness. And, and part of that was they, were, they submitted to the washing or the baptism to cleanse themselves of all sin. The change is now it's a spiritual baptize, baptism. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 13 we are now baptized into Christ. And the word baptism basically means it's an identification. We are being identified with Christ. Uh, Romans chapter 6 and verse 3. Go there very quickly. Romans chapter 6 and verse 3. Here Paul continues to build on his what he began in verse, chapter 1, as we talked about in the first session, that uh, of man's sin and God's response. And, and in chapter 6, he's talking about our identification with the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says in verse 3, Know ye not that so many of us as were what? Baptized what? Into Jesus Christ. Okay, now. What does 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 13 speak about? The Holy Spirit taking us and what? Putting us into Christ. So what Paul is talking about here is exactly what he talked about in 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 13. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Christ were baptized, identified with his death. Therefore, we are buried with him by that baptism into death. So what he's talking about here is we are totally identified with the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. So that he died, we died. He was buried, we were buried. He rose again, 
we have a resurrection. In fact, today, you and I, in Christ, are seated at the right hand of the Father. Amen, right? I'm sitting right beside God the Father. Ephesians chapter 2. I'm seated right next to the Father. Right at his right hand. Why? Because I'm in Christ. I'm in Christ. So here we have this. And he's, in, in these two verses, they're equated. What Paul's talking about in Romans 6 is what he's talked about in Romans 6, uh, 12, or 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I asked a pastor one time, is Romans 6 wet or dry? Is it wet or dry? These are his exact words. Exact words. It's dry. We, make, we like to make it mean water. It's dry. We, make the, we like to make it mean water. Now listen, friends. First of all, you can't change it. All right? The other thing is, if you like to make it mean water, what happens here is baptism ceases to be that typical outward sign of an inward cleansing, and it begins to be something absolutely necessary for salvation. You, you just can't change the scriptures to make it mean what you feel like. All right? Because you destroy it. You destroy it. And, and, and it is clear here, what Paul was talking about is not a water ritual. He's talking about the work of the Spirit of God upon our lives, placing us into Christ and identifying us with his death, burial, and resurrection. And there's not a drip of water included here. If there is, then you have to be baptized in order to be saved. in order to be saved. Look at Galatians chapter 3, just as we're there. Galatians chapter 3. Again, verse 26, For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ. For as many of you who have been baptized into Christ have what? Put on Christ. Again, that's not a watery, that's a spiritual act. That's 1 Corinthians 12 once again. Okay? Um, oh, I know what I wanted to talk about before we go, because we're going to leave this. One more thing. Go back to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians 4, the word one is used seven times. Let's call that the sevenfold, the oneness, unity, all right? But you know that there are two different Greek words translated one? It's not the same word. It's not the same word. And the word translated one for baptism isn't just one among many. It's one to the exclusion of all others. What's that mean? We've already seen there are many baptisms in Scripture. Figurative, ceremonial, spiritual. Paul comes along and says there's one baptism. Now, if there's only one baptism, I, I would think that it would behoove us to find out which one. Which one. And then when we find out that that one is to the exclusion of all others, we better be make sure that we're practicing the right one. And so under the mystery, we know, under the mystery, we know that that baptism is the work of the Holy Spirit taking us and placing us into Christ. When we add another one, no matter how innocent that might be, when we add another one, we've changed the Scripture. We've added to the Scripture. We've added an eighth one. Right? We've added an eighth one. You can't have one or two or three. One, one is one, right? You add one, you still have one. No, you add one, what do you have? Two. You add another one, what do you have? How do you get one? You only have one. It says here we have one Lord 
How many lords do we have? How many gods do we have? One. How many faiths do we have? One. And, when he, and the word faith there, again, is that body of truth. What Paul is urging here is to, is to unify around one single body of truth, the mystery. And what's happened in the world and happened in Christendom, what's happened in religion down through the years, that soon after Paul died, they started to fall off. Timothy died. Titus died. Silas died. Barnabas died. And the church reverted back to Peter. And the church reverted back to Rome. And it picked up the Roman practices. And even after the so-called Reformation, much of Rome was brought through in luggage. And it's still practiced today. It's still being practiced today. We walked away from the one faith, one Lord, one baptism. And, and we'll never have unity in the body until we unify around that one faith. That one faith. And that's what he tells us over in Ephesians chapter 4 as well, or later on in the chapter. And until we unify around that one faith, we're going to be children tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. And where's the church today? Where's the church today? We have a new commission. And I'm going to go through this quickly. The earthly commission given. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. What gospel? You have to ask yourself, what gospel? Well, from the description that Jesus had just given them, the, the, the most important thing is in Acts chapter 1, after the resurrection, Jesus met with the 12. Look at Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1 and verse 3, after the resurrection, Jesus takes the 12, or the 11 at this point, he takes the 11 and he takes them out and he takes them to school. Now he's about to leave. In Luke, we're told that during this time, he opens their eyes of understanding. These men walked with him and listened to him every day for three years, and yet failed to grasp what he was talking about. It wasn't really given to them yet to understand. But after the resurrection and during this 40-day period, Luke tells us that Jesus opened their eyes of understanding and they knew, they understood completely what he had talked about as far as uh, his death and the rebuilding of this and the resurrection. It was him. It was him. And so for 40 days, he takes them to school. And it says here in verse 3, to whom he showed himself alive after his passion, after his death, burial, and resurrection, by many infallible proofs, being seen of them 40 days, and speaking of the things pertaining to what? The kingdom of God. What has his whole ministry been about? The kingdom of God, the kingdom, the kingdom, the kingdom, here on earth, the kingdom the establishment of the kingdom. Now we're after the cross. And he changed? No. He's preparing these men to offer to Israel the king and the kingdom in the very next chapter. That's exactly what he'll do. He'll, they'll offer to Israel the king and the kingdom. So for 40 days, he teaches them. Now, I'm not going to take time to show you this. You'll have to believe me or go home and search it out. Be a Berean. Be a Berean. There's a lot of debate as to which commission. He gave a commission in Matthew 28. He gave a commission in Mark 16. He gave a commission in Luke 24. He gives them a commission in Acts 20, or John 20, and he gives them a commission in Acts 8. Among theologians, there's a debate as to which one of these is, written, is given to the church and which ones are given to Israel. And a lot of it has to do with their theological bent. Because some of them will take Mark 16. Others say, oh, no, 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 we can't do that. Because Mark 16 says, and these signs shall follow. They'll pick up serpents. They'll speak in other tongues. They'll raise the dead. 
<coughs> so if you don't believe in the sign gifts, the spiritual gifts, then, well, we can't have that one. That's not to us. That's to them. We'll take this one over here. Okay? <coughs> John chapter 20. Well, we can't have that one because, you see, that's where Rome gets the idea of a priest forgiving sin because Jesus gives them the right to forgive sin, to bind and to loose sin. Well, no, we can't do that. That's not our role. That's Jesus' role. So we, that's not to us. That's to them. And see, it goes back and forth with all of them. The only thing is, if that any of that is true, if any of that is true, Jesus is the most fickle person you've ever met in your life. And the reason I say that is, Remember, he spent 40 days teaching them, right? What did he give them during those 40 days? That Great Commission. The Great Commission, you go back and you look at it for yourself. The Great Commission always comes between two events, the resurrection and the ascension. The resurrection and the ascension. Every one of those commissions is given between the resurrection and the ascension. Now, if some of them are for us and some of them are not, and this is for this and this is for that, Jesus is fickle. What the great commissions are, you have five accounts, great five? Yeah, five accounts of the great commission, but they're five accounts of the same thing. Five accounts of the same thing. So if you want to know what Israel's commission or the Twelve's commission was, just blend them all together, and you have the whole thing. You have the whole thing. All of them were given his earthly commission. They were dealing with the earthly program with the nation of Israel, with the nation of Israel, right? Their five views are the same because they're all given at the same time, right? But the earthly commission has been superseded by a heavenly commission by heavenly commission. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 9. Ephesians 3 and verse 9. It says, and to make all Israel. No, what's it say? Make all. See, the word men there is in italic, italic, correct? You know what that means? When a word is in italics in, in the scriptures, what does that mean? It wasn't in their manuscript. It's supplied by the translators because they thought it would be easier, make it easier to read. Well, let me ask you a question. It says here, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. Does that, do you understand that any easier than if I were to read this? And to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery. All is all. It just seems to me that all said it all. What is, what is our responsibility today? To make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. And again, I'm not going to go into it right now. You can study. Pastor can study. it. But you know, there are many manuscripts that that word fellowship is the exact same word in the Greek translated dispensation later. Not in all the manuscripts, but some of them, that word fellow, translated fellowship is the same word translated dispensation later. Read it that way. To make all men see what is the what? Dispensation of the mystery. To make all men see what is the dispensation of the mystery. I was talking to a pastor who should know better a few years ago, and I said, but we need to emphasize the mystery, the mystery. He said, that's the difference between you and I. I said, what's that? He said, you emphasize the mystery, I emphasize fellowship. And, and we, need to, we need to emphasize the mystery because that's our source of hope, is it not? <laughs> that's where our fellowship comes from, right? <clears throat> we have a heavenly commission, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Of course, we have to see this. We can't just scoop over this one. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Anybody hungry? Good. 2 Corinthians 5, beginning with verse 14. For the love of Christ constraineth me or motivates me or compels me, compels us because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead, that he died for all, they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves. It's not all about me. 
It's all about him. Okay? <clears throat> but unto him which died for them and rose again, wherefore henceforth know we no man. No man. We read this last night, the, uh, verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. I think what he's talking about there is a dispensational change. We've gone from the old ways to new ways. Old expectations to new expectations. Okay? But he says, and all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and has given unto us what? Who is us? The body of Christ. It's not me. It's not Pastor Paul. It's not the professional. It's every one of us. We've all been given the ministry. Ministry is not passive, it's active. The ministry of reconciliation. What is that? That God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. It's our job to tell other people what Christ was really doing on Calvary's cross. What he did for them. That's the job that he's given to us. I don't, you know, I'd have chose to save people another way. He chose to use me. He chose to use you to be his mouthpiece, to stand in his place. In fact, he goes on to say that. All things are of God who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you, we pray you in Christ's, what? What do you have? In Christ's behalf, in Christ's stead, in Christ's place. You and I stand in the place of Christ today. When the world sees us, they need to see Christ, they need to hear Christ. He left us here. We have an awesome responsibility. And that, you know, you take that all around, the way we live, the way we talk, all of that should be brought in because it's Christ living in us. It's no longer us. The Christ. Okay? We have a new commission. We have a heavenly position. A heavenly position. In contrast to that earthly, we are citizenship. We are citizens of heaven. We, it is from there that we look for our Savior. Our citizenship is now in heaven. This, you know where we live today? We are ambassadors living behind enemy lines. This is Satan's domain. This is Satan's world. He is the God of this age. He is the God of this world. And let me say something, and you may not like this, but, but Christian, the church, is spending too much time trying to save America. We spend so much time saving the Constitution. They think that like we have the Constitution in the Bible. The Constitution in the Bible. This is God's word. That's man's. You know, we spend billions of dollars. The church has spent billions of dollars trying to save America while Americans go to hell. You know, we need to take our dollars and spend saving. Christian, saving Americans, sharing the gospel and reaching people for Christ. We have a heavenly citizenship. This world ain't my home. I'm just a passing through. That's right. And as I pass through, I'm supposed to be taking people with me. We have heavenly blessings. We are blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Does God bless us here? Sure he does. Sure he does. But the real blessings that we have in Christ, we have in him still. As I said earlier, we have a heavenly seat. We are seated at the right hand. We are to have a heavenly affection. Colossians chapter 1. Set your affection on things above, not on things of this earth. Again, we are so earthly minded that we forget. We forget. Everything's for us, here and now, here and now, here and now. Christ is the head. To Israel, Jesus was born their king. They were looking for a king, as we mentioned in 
a session ago, um, when the Magi came, they came looking for the one born king of Israel. Jesus didn't come to, be, uh, to become the king of Israel. He was the king of Israel. All right? And one day he will sit on that throne. And he will be king. To the church, he is our head. And the head, it from every, everything flows from the head, correct? How long can you live without the head? <laughs> everything flows from the, from the head. And, and he is called our head. In fact, you know what he's never called? You know what Paul never calls him in Scripture? King. Never refers to him as our king. Always our head. Always our head. Why? Because he was Israel's king. He was Israel's king. We have the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper is not an ordinance of the church. It's not an ordinance of the church. It is a remembrance. There are no ordinances in the church today, are there? What happened to them all? They were nailed to the cross. They were nailed to the cross. It is a remembrance. Just very quickly, since we're here in Corinthians, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Now remember what he said in Galatians chapter 1? The message, the gospel that I preach is not after men, for I neither received it of man, nor there was, neither was I taught it by man. What's, he, what's 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23? How's it start? For I have received. Received from where? The Lord. What Paul is about to outline here is not something, it's, it's new. It's new. He says, for I have received of the Lord that which, uh, uh, that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do what? In remembrance. When we take that piece of bread or that crack, whatever we use, cracker, whatever it is, when we take that in our hands, we are remembering what Christ did for us as his body was broken on our behalf. Now, I know there are those that say that that bread literally becomes the body of Christ, that that juice literally becomes the blood of Christ. And you have the body and the blood. Oh, not in appearance, but in reality, it does. It, this is the body, and that's the blood. And you ask them, have you ever received Christ in your life? What do they say? I do it every week. See? It's a remembrance. It is to cause us to remember what Christ did for us, how his body was broken, how he shed his blood for us. We are to be reminded of that. Because sometimes I think we forget. And we go off on our, doing our thing. And it says on down here, um, for as often as you eat and drink, huh? 26, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do what? Show, what do you have, Randy? Huh? Proclaim. Make it known. You make known, all right? You show the Lord's death till he comes. Now, I think that the communion service does two things. Number one, it reminds us of what Christ did for us. And we declare that to, to others around. Okay? This is what he did. He, his body was broken. His blood was spilt for me. He paid the price of my sin. And then what it does is reminds me that someday he's coming to take me back to him. Because it says we do it until when? Until he comes. Until he comes. <laughs> until he comes, well, look at that. His appearing in the air. The appearance of prophecy. Because, you know, the coming of Christ is not, just the coming of Christ is not new, is it? 
The fact that he would come again is not new. The prophet spoke of that. And in Zechariah 14, 14, he talks about him coming back, and it says when he comes back again, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. And not only that, when his feet touch the Mount of Olives, the mountain splits in two. Splits in two. Because he's about to do something he's never done before. Okay? But when he comes back, he comes back, and he comes back, and he touches the ground. He touches the ground. Acts chapter 1 and verse 9, he says, When I come, you, the way I come, the way I go is the way you're going to see me come. We're going to come right back down, right here. Right here. Watch for me, right here, because that's where I'm going to be. Remember what he says to them when he says to pray? He says, Lo, lo, here I am with you, what? Always. Everything he did to Israel caused them to do what? Look here. Look here. Look here. Everything Paul tells us is to look there. Look there. We have the secret coming. The secret coming of Christ. Um, <clears throat> 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 4. Let's just look at that very quickly. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Verse 13, but I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who are asleep or those who have died, that you sorrow not even as others or to the same degree as those who have no hope. So we're talking about two groups of people, those in Christ and those who are not in Christ, those who have hope, those who don't have hope. And yet when we lose a loved one who was in Christ, we have tears, but our tears are tempered with a hope. So we don't grieve to the point of those who have no hope. For if we believe, that Jesus died and rose again, even so also them which sleep or those who have died in Christ will he bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord that we which are alive remain until the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven, shall do what? Descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ, what? shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be what? Caught up. We're not looking for him to come down. We're looking for a going up. And I got a sign on my office that says, when the, trumpet, when the last trumpet sounds, I'm out of here. That's what it is. When that trumpet sounds, get ready because you're about to leave. And that word caught, in the Greek, is the Greek word harpezo. And what that means is to be transported like that from one place to another, just like that. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul describes that. He says what? In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. He said that's all going to happen, just like that. We're going to be gone. That's his secret coming. Israel is looking for his second coming. We're looking for his secret coming. And his secret coming will precede his second coming by seven years at least. It could be more. By seven years. Okay? But, but he will come back. But the, when he comes back the next time, it's for his church. And we're out of here. And, and listen, the last couple of years we've had a lot of predictions. A lot of predictions. What was it, a year and a half ago, we were in May, was going to be the rapture. And then he had to come out and say, well, I made a mistake. That's not really what I meant. What it's in October. So we went through October. We all got ready, packed our bags. And it didn't happen. Susan and I went on our farewell tour. <laughs> and, and it didn't happen. And then we were told it was December 2012. Okay. That was the end of the Mayan calendar. It's all over. You know, they wrote books, made movies, all this stuff. And here we are, you know. And, and when, it, when you're talking about the rapture, the one thing I hear people say is, don't forget, 
nobody knows the hour. The Bible says no one knows the hour that he will come. But you know what the Bible doesn't say about the rapture? The Bible never says concerning the rapture, no one knows when he will come. You see, that quote from Scripture has nothing to do with the rapture. It's about the second coming. It's about the second coming. It's not about the secret coming. There are no signs for his return. We're not looking for wars and rumors of wars and all of those things. Those all have to do with what? The second coming. He could come before we eat today. Now, I'm sure all you women who have made something would be saying, and I wasted all that time making that food. (laughs) Can I take it with me? (laughs) But he could come at any moment. It's a secret coming. All we know is he's coming. And all we know is be ready and be busy. Busy. Busy can be defined in two ways. How busy are you? Busy. Burdened under Satan's yoke. Or burdened under the Savior's yoke. How are you busy? As we wait. As we wait. Titus chapter 2 verse 13 calls his secret coming what? Our blessed hope. Our blessed hope. Okay. <clears throat> One common misconception, and and I'm going to go this quick. I'm not going to make a lot of comments here because we're running out of time. I don't know how much time we have, but, um, huh? 14 minutes? 13, 14 minutes? All right. In Jude chapter 1 and verse 14, it says that when he comes, he comes with his saints. And, And a lot of people believe that when the church is raptured away, we go up here, we spend the tribulation up here, and then when the Lord comes here, we all come back with him. That's Jude chapter 1. They take Jude chapter 1 and verse 14, and they say that. First of all, the problem with that is they're taking a, a, a book that was written to who? Israel, Israel and, and, and superimposing it upon the church. The problem is, is in the translation of the word saints, because the word saints simply means his holy ones. It doesn't mean us. It doesn't have to mean us. Right? It means his holy ones. Right? You compare Matthew. Go back to Matthew 24. Matthew 24. Now in Matthew 24, what is Jesus talking about there? Matthew 24 and 25. What is Jesus talking about? What event? His second coming. Not his secret coming. His second coming. In Matthew 24, look at verse 30. He says this, And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man. Uh, Someone said he thinks that's going to be a cross. I don't know. I don't know. I think it's going to be the same thing that appeared in the sky the night Christ was born. I think it's going to be a bright star. Because I think that star is the Shekinah glory of God. And every time God is present, what's present with him? His glory. His glory. But anyway, he says, Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and glory. And he shall send his... There's that phone ring again. Remember what it means, okay? An angel just got his ring. <laughs> um, and he shall send his what? Angels. He shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. What we have is his second coming and the regathering of Israel. That's what he's talking about there. That's what he's talking about there. But who's he send to do his bidding? The saints? No, it's his angels. Jude would be much better translated if the translators would have made it angels, his holy ones. 
And that's the way it's translated elsewhere in Deuteronomy, in Psalms, and here in Matthew 24. Okay? The judgment seat of Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10. Second Corinthians 5 and verse 10. Verse 9, set the stage. Wherefore we labor that whether present or absent, we, shall, we may be accepted of him. In the preceding verses, Paul talks about being absent from the body and what? Present with the Lord. As long as we are here, we are away. But someday we're going home. And, and the moment we die, we're absent from the body, present with the Lord. At some time in the future, in, in the rapture, we will be absent from here and in his very presence. And he says then, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. That judgment seat is the Bema seat of Christ. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Now, wait a minute. Sin was forgiven, correct? So we can't be talking about that here, can we? I, what we're talking about there is what have we done for him and what did we do for us? Because what we do for us gets nothing. Gets nothing. You can have the biggest house. You can drive the newest cars. You can have the biggest phone, uh, boat. You can fly your own airplane. It don't matter, folks. When you stand before the beam of seat of Christ, that will count for nothing. God will not be pleased because you've done that. What we receive reward for is what we've done for him. What we've done for him. Remember, sin has been dealt with. Praise God, I don't have to answer for that. He answered for that already. And he says, the things that are done, therefore knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we might but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also made manifest into your conscience. But we have that. We have that. Romans chapter 14, he talks about this beam of seed of Christ again and the receiving of rewards. And, and he goes on in, in Corinthians and talks about the fact that, you know, all of those things that we do, some of them are going to be burned up. It's just so much wood, hay, and stubble. Those are all those things we did in the flesh for ourselves. But the things that we've truly done for him, he said, for that we receive what? Reward. We receive reward. We have a, the judgment seat of Christ. Now, the world is looking forward to what? The great white throne judgment. And people of all ages will one day will stand before that white throne judgment. And he's going to open up the book of life. And he's going to open up the other book, it says. And people are going to stand before him and they will be judged out of those books. They will be judged out of those books. And whosoever name is not found written down in the, in the book of life will be cast into hell. The lake of fire. You see, like I said the other night, everybody one day will stand before the throne of God. Everybody. Everybody from Adam on will stand before the throne of God. And he will either be your judge or your savior. And that comes because you believe him or you reject him. That's it. Believe me or reject me. But everybody stands and will give an answer one day before the judgment of God. But the judgment seat of Christ is unique to this dispensation. The only people who stand before that are those people who are died or raptured away from this present dispensation. Nobody from the past, of course, nobody from the future, only this dispensation. It's unique for us. The ministry of the Holy Spirit, and, and I've already touched on this earlier, the indwelling, the empowerment uh, of the Spirit, 
and, and the fact that he indwells us, he lives within us. We are the very temple, the dwelling place of God today. As the spirit of God dwells within us. You know, when, when you raise kids and you tell them not to eat the cookie, and when you're not looking, they grab a cookie and they run and they hide behind the sofa and they eat it because you'll never know. <laughs> but kids, don't listen. The one thing I learned was you just have to rearrange the cookie. But you can't take too many. <laughs> but we have the indwelling of the Spirit of God living within us today. There's nowhere we can go. We cannot hide behind the sofa. Why not? Because the moment I get behind the sofa, where's God? <laughs> he's behind that sofa too. You know? No matter where I go, he's always there because he, he lives within me. You want to talk? Now, of course, you don't have that problem here. But uh, I go into a lot of churches, and there'll be a sign outside the door, and they'll say, this is the sanctuary. You know the, the room? No, it isn't. You know what that is? That's just a big room with chairs in it. Where's the sanctuary of God today? Right here. It's me. He lives within me. He's dwelling within me. We walk in the sphere of the Holy Spirit. Okay? <clears throat> We have the revelation of the fullness of God, the glorious description of Christ. He is our all in all. In him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. You want to know what God looks like? Look at the Savior. You want to know how God the Father thinks? Look at the Savior. He is an exact replica of the Father. He is completeness, the fullness of him. Okay, His being in time. And, and that is all equated with those who are in Christ. So remember now, we have the mind of Christ because we're in Christ, right? And we share with him in all things. Okay. How important is the mystery? Well, to the unsaved, <laughs> it's, it's, it's the only gospel. It's the only way. It's the only way of life that they have. It's the only way of life that they have. Now, I, like I said the other night, there may be a church out there that doesn't understand all of what Paul taught, and all they know is his gospel. It's amazing to me how many fundamental evangelical Bible teaching churches, when it comes to the gospel, guess where they go? To Paul. Because they know there's the truth. The sad thing is they get them saved, then they take them back under the law. But it's the only place of, of the good news. There are many good news mentioned in Scripture. When God covered Adam, that was a good news, but it won't work today. It's not the good news for today. The good news today is the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> God has made it known, and he's given us a message to them, and we need to get that message out. To the saved, well, first of all, it's God's will that we learn it. God's desires that all men be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. It's his will that we proclaim it. <clears throat> we are to know of its riches. Okay? We are established by it. Well, Paul's just pointing up. I don't know what that meant. <laughs> we are proclaimed for our obedience. To the saved, we include our, its warning that we just read. Okay. An overview of the mystery then. The cross is presented as good news, not in condemnation. The nations are saved through Israel's fall, not Israel's rise. The church, the body of Christ, is not found outside of Paul's epistles. Our citizenship is in heaven, not on the earth. Paul is the apostle of the Gentiles, not the twelve. 
We have the secret appearing of Christ, not the second coming of Christ. We have a new heavenly commission, not the so-called great commission. And it's to all men who claimed in obedience. All right? Let's close with prayer. Father, we thank you for this weekend, for these sessions, that we can look at the mystery and how important it is in our lives. Father, I would pray that we would be students of your word, that we would learn to study the word as Bereans, to understand the word of God rightly divided, that we may know what you are doing today, and that we may gain that hope that is found only in Christ Jesus. We thank you, Father, for the salvation that is ours in Christ, the forgiveness that is ours in Christ, the hope that is ours in Christ. And I would pray, Father, that all of us, myself included, be diligent in carrying out that work of reconciliation, sharing the ministry of reconciliation with the lost world. And, Father, that we would live in the glory of your grace from day to day. Thank you, Father, for your word. Thank you for this time. And we pray this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.